Syracuse herbarium is home to one of the largest collections of dried plant specimens in the world. Over the past two centuries, taxonomists have organized and cataloged over seven million specimens. The original purpose in collecting all this together was figuring out what they could be used for and if you could cultivate them, where were the best places to cultivate them outside their native range. So you had tea from China, bananas from Malaysia, coffee from Africa, and oil producing trees from Brazil. You could say that it was a stamp collection of sorts. In the 18th century, Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus developed the binomial system of naming. So each species had a two-parted name. A larger category, which we now call genus, and one that referred to the species. And that was really a breakthrough because it allowed people very quickly and accurately to tell each other which species they were talking about. In the 19th century, Charles Darwin published his revolutionary book, Origin of Species. He had observed that different plants had similarities to each other, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he realized that mm -hmm. all of them must have shared a common ancestor. Ah, uh, yes. The idea of classification became stronger, and Q, in fact, developed its own system of morphological classification, entirely based on what you could see with the naked eye, and a little bit that you could see with the microscope the plant tree began to take form. Our most recent development, understanding the plant family tree, came with the introduction of DNA technology in the 1980s. By being able to look at the molecules of plants, we can now understand the evolution of plants over time and trace in incredible detail the diversity back to its simplest origins. What's incredible is that 90% of the families that had been previously defined based on morphological characteristics were verified by the DNA work. Five hundred million years ago, it was just various groups of algae red, green, brown, the green algae started to first make their way onto land, developing into more complex structures, like the liverworts, hornworts, and mosses. A hundred million years later, we started to see things such as club mosses, ferns, and horsetails. And then 50 million years later, plants with seeds that were organized into cones came into existence such as the conifers, cycads, and spruces. The world was a green place, lots and lots of green, a few brown cones, but color wasn't there. Everything was just very photosynthetic, very nice. Roughly about 140 million years ago, the flowering plants appeared. And really, that still is a bit of a mystery. 350,000 species in total. Incredibly complex and diverse. The lilies, orchids, grasses, palms, gingers, magnolias, cacti, peas and beans, potatoes, roses, mints. Flowers really changed the world. They made possible an incredible diversity of other kinds of lifestyles for other organisms. They feed us, clothe us, provide us with medicines, products to build our homes out of, etc.
the plant family tree gives us a framework for asking the really important questions about how our ecosystems function. It's those connections that tell us most of what we want to know about evolution of life of not just plants, but the other things that depend upon plants, which is everything. The evolutionary tree is a great achievement. You can see it as a tool for the rest of science and the rest of humanity. The process now is 95% complete. So the story is pretty well told now, I would say. Okay, we're rolling, that's good. It's all taxonomy, it's just categorising things and understanding differences. Difference between the... Uh, yeah, just hold that, everyone. That's quite funny, actually. <laughs>